Phillips. We are very honored this morning to have with us uh, Senator Kristen Phillips Hill for the 28th Senatorial District. Uh, she joins us here on WSBA. Good morning, Senator. How are you? Good morning, Gary. I'm well. Great to be with you this morning. Well, it's good to have you in this morning. A little sunshine coming through the windows today, so we're starting it off on a sunshine way. But you're always a sunshiny, bright kind of person, so this is not unusual for you, right? Well, you know what? I love getting up early in the morning, uh, watching the sunrise over over Lake Redmond, and um, getting on with the people's work today. Well, there you go. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the people's work at the moment. Obviously, you know, I was thinking about it the other day. Uh, we're in a time, it seems like we're in a time of emergency now. You know, we're in a time of emergency. Uh, we, we have lots of protests for lots of various reasons. We've got protests because of uh, the, the COVID thing. We've got protests now uh, about the death of uh, George uh, Floyd in Minnesota and, and injustices that people see and perceive here in our country. Uh, we seem to be living in a time of emergency uh, where governors are, uh, you know, calling emergencies on COVID, calling emergencies in cities to make sure people are safe, uh, calling out National Guard, things like that. Um, it's a very unsettling kind of time, isn't it? Well, you know, I think you can you can look at it in many different ways. Um, but, you know, I have had conversations with you about the Constitution and right. some really good conversations about the Constitution. And I think um, what we have seen over the past few days and in the past few months is that um, that document is so essential, right? Um, the, the murder of George Floyd, um, people were upset. They peacefully assembled and... Uh, exercise their constitutional right to assemble and to speak uh, to the injustice that, that they feel. And, you know, last night in New York, there was a peaceful protest. Um, law enforcement did a great job. Uh, community leaders did a great job. And um, people exercised their constitutional rights. And um, it, it was powerful. Uh, so, you know, we've seen that, you know, when the governor has overreached his authority, um, people have pushed back. They have taken to the streets and said, um, we've had enough. And so um, I think in the most challenging of times, that document has been a, a solid rock, a foundation um, that, that's getting us through these difficult challenges that we face. And yet we watch in the peaceful protest those who would, you know, take it for another purpose and loot and, and riot in some cases. And again, there are groups behind that. We would watch as politicians in some cases would take advantage of the COVID-19 time to try to get pet projects in, uh, to try to get things in that don't seem to be for the welfare of all people, whether it's a state or the country or whatever. Uh, we watch people grandstanding from time to time on these kind of things. And so, you know, our, it's, it's interesting we look at our, our nation based on liberty and freedom and based on a constitution, as you so rightfully point out, where the media seems to take those situations and those people and make them more important than the people that have what I would say is the organic, real feeling about uh, concerns in this country uh, be they about COVID-19 or be they about uh, the death of a black man and, and a possible injustice by uh, various members of the police forces around the country. You know, does that make any sense at all? Well, look, you're always going to have uh, bad elements. I say this all the time. There are bad politicians and good politicians. You know, we know there are, are bad police officers and good police officers. There are bad radio hosts and, and good radio hosts, right? I mean, be um, careful now. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I do believe that, that good always triumphs yeah. over evil and that we will prevail. I do, too, or I have. Um, and, and sometimes it's going to be a lot longer time for that to happen than maybe I would like, I suppose. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, a Christian, and, and I always believe God's time is not my time. So uh, I don't pretend to... Uh, you know, go to that pay grade to try to figure out, uh, you know, it, it, but we're a nation that is very impatient, I would say. Wouldn't you agree that we'd like to things to happen now? I mean, we're in the we're, we're we, we want to go quickly. And 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 
right. things are not happening now. And but but I, maybe the fact that we're impatient maybe is a good thing because we're constantly trying to push the envelope. Maybe we're not pushing as hard on some things as we should from time to time. Your thoughts? Well, I, I think you know. It, in my work in the legislature, I've found that, you know, you have to be persistent and dogged and determined um, mm-hmm. to to get things done that people at home need you to accomplish. And sometimes it's frustrating. You know, I talk to people and they just say, just, just get it done. And, and you know, um, right. oh, my gosh, I want it done that quickly, too. And, you know, there are times when I will have conversations and, and um, you know, those colleagues who I can reach out to for sage advice say, you know, remember, Kristen, on average, it takes six years from an idea to go to a law. So if you can get it done sooner than that, that's really right. something. So um, and you're right. Uh, everything gets done in God's time. When it, well, it, it needs to happen, it will happen. I often equate uh, doing legislation, because I've obviously studied that and taught it during my lifetime, haven't had to go through it like you have and trying to, to get it to get it done. But uh, I said it's like taking a dinosaur for a walk. It's slow and ponderous, but you eventually get there. Uh, and, and that's one of the problems. Uh, unless we have, and, and there are a certain number of politicians who like to talk about this until they have to get elected again and talk about it again. And none of us like those kind of politicians in terms of their actions. Um, speaking of uh, COVID-19, uh, yes. The time of emergency. Uh, have we passed that? Obviously, there is legislation in the state house and state senate now uh, to say it's time to end the emergency. It's time to get back to the legislature having a role to play in legislation, not just uh, governmental edicts from the governor. Uh, your your take on the status of that so far? About forty five seconds left in this segment, and then we'll have another one with you. Go ahead. Well, I'm fully supportive of that measure. Uh, the house sent over. House Resolution 836, Representative Russ Diamond, they amended it. Um, they, they, I think, Im- improved on the, the legislation. We also have Senate Resolution 323, Senator Doug Mastriano, who represents the western portion of York. Um, both of those are pending. And, and look, um, I think that the governor has made it very clear he's not working well with the General Assembly. Um, you look, just on Monday night, he decided to extend the deadline when mail-in ballots can be received and counted by county election officials in six counties. Um, we found out about that at 6.30 on Monday night. So, you know, I think he continues to overstep his legal authority, issue edicts without the legislature's input. I think we can do better, and, and I'm very supportive of Um, voting for that measure. Senator Kristen Phillips-Hill of the 28th Senatorial District here in Pennsylvania. Senator Hill, when you you look at that legislation you were talking about a little bit ago, I think it's 836, um, the idea of ending the emergency, uh, obviously people are saying, well, this is just another one of those bills where you run it through, you run it up the flagpole, and the governor vetoes it, and that's that. Uh, and, and what's really ironic about the legislation, obviously, is, is trying to get the governor to give up some of the power. There is a part of the emergency acts that says after 90 days, the emergency generally is supposed to not end, but the, the legislative branch should be involved. This is kind of unprecedented to keep the legislature out of the process, as you've mentioned on several different items this morning. Um, does this have any chance of overriding the uh, governor's veto if, if you do get this all the way through to him and he vetoes it again? Well, you know, Gary, what I can tell you is that I, I think that our colleagues on the other side of the aisle are, are starting to feel as frustrated as, as you know, we are. And, and that is that, you know, they vote again opening up real estate, and then send a letter asking the governor to please open up real estate. They vote against legislation that would have reopened a lot of other business sectors responsibly, intelligently, and safely, right? We're not saying just, you know, go out and with blatant disregard to to public health, go about doing things. Um, And they vote against that bill, and then they come back and send a letter saying, oh, please, Governor, do this, right? I mean, even members from the very progressive areas of the Southeast are signing letters to the governor saying, could you please allow our businesses to have curbside pickup, right? Right. So I I think 
people everywhere are getting to the point where they want to see light at the end of the tunnel. And I think a lot of the frustration is, is that the governor has really danced around how he came up with the metric of 50 new cases per 100,000 residents, right? right? And last week, he tried to explain it, and, and, and he was just talking in circles. And this was the metric that he used early on in determining when counties can move from this red phase to the yellow phase, from the yellow phase to the green phase. And I don't think he can explain it any longer. I wrote a letter outlining how York Countyans have really led during this pandemic, right. why we need to move to the green phase. Um, I haven't gotten a reply yet. But, you know, making up metrics using subjective criteria and arbitrary data is not in the best public interest. Well, and, and I think one of the things that, that people at least perceive right now from the governor is uh, the idea that he is disdainful of any other points of view. I got a, I got a note uh, yesterday from someone that said, would you like to go attend one of his press conferences? I don't want to go through a daily recitation of, of what he's doing there. I get those anyway. But the, the point being, I, I don't want to stand there and be lectured to like uh, a college professor lecturing to me like I was in school. We are the government. And one of the things that I think bothers me on both Republicans and Democrats, and I, I, will, I will tar and feather both their houses, is this idea that, you know, the caucus is more important than the people. And the idea that uh, if you have a governor in that's of your particular party, you're being Republican or Democrat, that it's more important to support his policies than it is to do right by the people. And therein lies my greatest disagreement with politics versus good policy. In other words, good policy gets held captive to bad politics. Your thoughts on that, about a minute left. Well, I think that you always, always have to put people over politics. Um, yesterday was Election Day. There were elections all over the Commonwealth, and there were some really fascinating results in primaries. I think in large part because when members forget who they are and where they come from and who they're responsible to, um, the voters will take to the ballot box and make the change that needs to happen. I, I hope. I mean, I hope you're right on that. I, I'm not sure we always do that. I've seen it, though, uh, with the uh, paycheck thing some years ago. We voted out a, uh, a, a, ju a judge and almost voted out another one. Uh, and we raised Kane about that. And, and, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I think we need to get back to, as a populist, too, that policy is more important than politics and make sure that our representatives are well aware, aware of that. I know you and I have talked about that a lot over the last few years. And I will say this, too, Gary. Um, having, having voted against my caucus in the mm -hmm. past, um, because that's what the people in, this, in the district that I represented expected, um, mm -hmm. You know, taking some hard stances on issues. You know, property taxes is, is, a, is an issue that, you know, I constantly stand on the position of eliminating property taxes. Yeah. It doesn't always make me popular in Harrisburg, but that's not what's important, right? Um, my job is to uh, be the voice and do the will of the people of the 28th district. Yep. And so that's, that's what you always have to do. And, and it is tough. I mean, you remember, it, it's like being in high school and, and not going along with the crowd, right? right. It, it, it feels uncomfortable, but you know what, that's, that's what you were elected to do. And that's what you need to do. Well, we just need to, our, a lot of our politicians just need to remember who the we's and the they's are, that the we's are the people uh, and the days are the caucus. And, you know, when we remember that and what you just outlined, it's so important that I think we're in much better shape. Thank you for taking the time this morning with us, Senator. We really appreciate it. And, and have a great day. We'll look forward to talking to you again very, very soon. Thank you so much, Gary. Take Thank care. You. Senator Kristen Phillips Hill with us here on WSBA Morning News with Gary Sutton. WSBA Morning News with Gary Sutton. WSBA